Good morning, everybody. You're all very welcome indeed to this special event at the uh, Institute for International and European Affairs. My name is John O'Brennan. I hold the Jean Monnet Chair in European Integration at Maynooth University, and I'm a member of the Institute's Global Europe Group. We are delighted today to be able to host this uh, event, the title of which is Towards the European Union, Georgia, Moldova and Ukraine, vision for the future of the Eastern Partnership. We are very grateful for uh, the support of our co-organizers today, the embassies of Georgia, Moldova and Ukraine. So special thanks go out to uh, the ambassadors, uh, Ambassador George Zerbashvili of Georgia, Ambassador Mikule of Moldova and Ambassador Shalaput of Ukraine. Um, just a few words on organization. Um, each of our speakers is going to have five to seven minutes and anticipating that that will conclude about 11.45, we will then have about 45 minutes or so for questions. If audience members would like to ask a question, you can do so by using the Q&A function on Zoom. So if you send your questions through, I'll be able to direct them to the specific speaker or if it's a general question um, to the panel. A reminder that this morning's addresses and the Q&A similarly are both being delivered on the record. Um, and so just briefly to introduce each of our speakers. It's a pleasure firstly to welcome Lawrence Meredith. Lawrence is the Director of Neighbourhood East and Institution Building within the European Commission. So the Eastern Partnership is very much uh, Lawrence's bailiwick, so to speak. We also welcome from Dublin Ambassador Joe Hackett, who is the Director General of the European Union Division within the Irish Department of Foreign Affairs. We also welcome Salom Shapkidze, who is the head of the EU Integration Department at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Georgia. We welcome Vladimir Cook, who is the acting head of European Integration, the European Integration Directorate in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and European Integration of the Republic of Moldova. And last but certainly not least, we welcome Marina Mikhailenko, who is the Director of the Department for the European Union and NATO in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Ukraine. It's a great pleasure then to begin our proceedings and in doing so, I invite Lawrence to take the floor. Lawrence. Uh, great, thank you very much, Joe. Uh, wonderful be, to be with you all this morning um, in this digital environment. I'm uh, really honored to have the opportunity to open this event. Um, of course, I would have enjoyed it all the more if we could have gathered as on a previous occasion uh, in Dublin, but I'm sure we'll have that opportunity uh, in the future. And um, it comes at a very timely moment uh, because um, we uh, celebrated last year the 10th anniversary of the Eastern Partnership. And we celebrated it by a, a massive public consultation on what should be the future of the Eastern Partnership. Then in March this year, and in fact, it was the first ever document adopted online by the College of Commissioners in 60 years. It so happened that it fell on early March uh, and we had to real scramble to finalize it, um, but we managed it. And that I think it's appropriate that the theme, uh, given the uh, dreadful year that 2020 is proving to be, is reinforcing resilience in the Eastern Partnership. Um, and uh, of course, none of us would have liked to see how relevant this has become uh, in the face of this dreadful COVID pandemic. Um, but where is the future of the Eastern Partnership going? We think it's evolution, not revolution. We got a lot of support for the fact that the um, Eastern Partnership in its first 10 years has focused on delivering tangible results for the citizens of the Eastern Partnership. So what are we proposing to change? Well, I think in response to the pandemic, the number one priority for all citizens, and in fact, I've just come from a presentation on opinion polls across the Eastern Partnership, is the economy, economy and connectivity. 
so important to rebound from this uh, dreadful COVID pandemic. The next point I would like to make is that we got strong feedback uh, that um, citizens in the Eastern Partnership and EU alike felt that it was important to do more on the values agenda. And I know that this is something that resonates uh, in Dublin. That means we had one of the four priorities was governance before. Now, two of the five priorities will focus on values issues. That will include on the harder side, really um, justice reform is crucial. I think this is one of the big obstacles today, but also tackling organized crime and corruption. And then as events, uh, and I know we're focusing on Ukraine, Georgia uh, and Moldova, but as we see across the region events in Belarus, the need for a more inclusive society, the importance of independent media and civil society. And there, I think Georgia, Ukraine and Moldova can really show leadership. And I'm very interested to hear what participants will say. So we need to protect, uh, but we also need to uh, empower. And those are strong messages that we got from the consultation. Uh, and finally, the fourth and fifth priorities comes as no surprise, the digital transformation and the green transition. And we wouldn't even be having this discussion if we weren't getting uh, individually better at the digital transformation. <laughs> but also, I think, as President von der Leyen said in her excellent State of the Union speech the other day, it's important to build back better. And that's going to be a greener future in line with Paris uh, and what the priorities of young people are. Uh, because I think you know what I and I'm looking forward to hearing from Georgia, Moldova, Ukraine, what we hear from their citizens is they want more of Europe. And I think that's something that's interesting for us to listen to on the inside of the European Union and something that we really need to help them deliver, both in substance, but also in strategic communication. And that's why uh, the opinion poll work that we're doing also really helps us target our support. But of course, listening carefully to Georgia, Moldova, Ukraine is also key. So with that, I'm looking forward to the other speakers' presentations and I'm, of course, looking forward to the questions and answers. Thank you very much, Jeff. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Lawrence. Uh, our second speaker this morning is Ambassador Joe Hackett. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, thanks to the IIEA um, for facilitating this important and timely discussion. Thanks to, to Lawrence um, for his leadership on all things Eastern Partnership and his interest in uh, the Irish dimension uh, to that and the way he's helped guide and advise us in terms of our national approach to each Eastern Partnership. And a special thank you to our colleagues uh, in Georgia, Ukraine and Moldova, uh, both for being here, but also for how active their embassies are here and for making sure that we are well informed about developments in their countries, but also across the Eastern Partnership. Um, look, I think it's self-evident looking at the, the map that Ireland is in a European context geographically distant from most, indeed all, of the Eastern Partnership countries. Um, there could be a tendency to say, well, that's far away. Why should we really engage in that agenda? And yet we have, and not only have we engaged and been strongly supportive of the Eastern Partnership, but I think each of those countries and that region as a whole resonates here both with our people and politically for a number of reasons. Um, I think first, there's a natural uh, appreciation that all of those countries um, have a complex historical relationship with a very large challenging neighbor. Um, and in an Irish context, that automatically resonates given our own history. Um, I think more recently, we're a country and a people who really recognized the economic transformation that happened in our country as a result of our membership of the European Union and our engagement with a large, well-disposed multilateral organization. So economic change in countries transitioning out of a previous situation, like all the countries, Eastern Partnership is one that resonates here. And likewise, um, changes in society is also something that, that we can relate to in terms of improvement of our governance, of our values, of our social policy. Ireland has been transformed through our membership of the European Union. And that similar process is something that we have prioritized in the context of the Eastern Partnership. 
we have people, particularly from Moldova, Georgia, and Ukraine living here in increasing numbers. Uh, so we have diasporas here from your countries, and they have an impact in, in our approach. Um, and then, as Lawrence has said, rule of law values and conflict resolution are all cornerstones of our foreign policy. And they're all themes that find uh, a strong echo and resonance uh, in the Eastern Partnership agenda. So we've been supportive, like many member states, of the principles of conditionality, of inclusiveness, of differentiation. Um, and they have underpinned our approach uh, to the Eastern Partnership and as we look forward to the next 10 years. And specific areas where we've tried to prioritize is climate and increased cooperation in raising climate standards in the region, uh, youth um, and values and governance. Now, I think there can be a tendency to look at the Eastern Partnership 10 years on and go through each country and go, well, we've had a major international crisis in Ukraine with Crimea annexed and a continuing conflict in the East. We still have the two regions um, in Abkhazia and South Ossetia contested and increasingly unstable. Um, we have continued uh, uncertainty around Transnistria in the context of Moldova. We have dictatorship uh, more than ever before since the early 90s in Belarus. And we have a war between Armenia and Azerbaijan. And you might say, well, the Eastern Partnership hasn't been very successful um, in, if you look at that landscape. And yet, if you go through the level of transformation in trade and investment, in improvement in infrastructure and transport, in enhanced climate standards in those countries, particularly the three here, in increased digital uh, connectivity, in opportunities for youth uh, by the extension of the Erasmus programme, and of course, very visibly, visa liberalisation, the relationship over 10 years has in many ways been transformed that those, in those countries that, that sought to, um, to grasp it. Um, I think internally within the EU, um, having the Eastern Partnership as a framework has, has helped us enormously maintain a degree of unity. It's provided a framework that has helped the European Union navigate both the economic relationship with Eastern Partnership countries, but also navigate through the various crises that we've staggered from one to the other over the last 10 years. And, as, and maintaining that framework gives us a framework through which we can approach new crises, as we've seen applied to Belarus and the role of the Eastern Partnership and amending the Eastern Partnership and using that framework to deal with the Belarus situation has been very important. I think at the same time, if we're honest, um, Eastern Partnership was designed, although only 10 years ago, at a different time. Yes, we've had, we had the experience in Georgia, so our eyes had been opened somewhat, but it was certainly pre-Ukraine and pre the very sharp deterioration in relations with Russia that have happened since 2013, 2014. And I think it was designed initially a little bit very much in the, in the previous neighborhood policy where our regions to the south and the east, uh, we assumed would increasingly want to be like us and emulate us. And through our neighborhood policy, we would spread our values and our approach to the economy and approach to societies. And I think we've realized that while our intentions uh, from our perspective <clears throat> may be good, they are seen potentially as threatening elsewhere. That for Ireland, we've never seen the Eastern Partnership as a geopolitical construct. We've never seen it as targeted societies and future they want to create and while others may seek to geopolitics for Ireland we will always insist that where countries in the Eastern Partnership are elsewhere want to choose a future that is more closely aligned to Europe that is their choice to make and if they want to make that choice that is something that we should facilitate and engage with them on thank you thank you very much indeed ambassador um, now to our third speaker this morning. Uh, we're delighted to welcome the head of EU integration in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Georgia, Salom Shapikidze. Salom. Very warm greetings from Tbilisi. 
Firstly, let me thank Ireland for hosting the event and organizers, the Embassy of Georgia, of Moldova and Ukraine, the Institute of International and European Affairs, especially Mr. Andrew Gilmore and John O'Brennan. Thank you for your moderation. And of course, I'm very happy to see Mr. Lawrence Meredith and Mr. Joe Hackett and my dear colleagues from Moldova and Ukraine. This is a very good initiative to bring uh, together the three associated countries. Indeed, the three of us, EU aspiring nations. Thank you, Lawrence, for saying that we need more EU. Indeed, we need that. And the three of us are having association agreements, VCFTAs. The three of us are having the same interests as well as challenges. Therefore, it is only natural that the three of us, we wish to talk to each other and also with the EU together with the EU. And I really hope that uh, in the future we will have more occasions and formats where the three of us, uh, similarly to the DCFTA ministerial, similarly to the DCFTA format, will be discussing with the EU other dimensions of the association agreement. Uh, this is also a very timely event. Indeed, we have assessed already in a way uh, the decade of the partnership, we have assessed the achievements, but we also identified gaps and lessons learned. And on the other hand, we are now in the process of shaping the future of the EC partnership post 2020. Again, for Georgia, EC partnership laid solid ground in advancing our bilateral relations with the EU. They translated into solid framework of association agreement with the DCFTA, with the free trade, with the visa free regime into being translated of Georgia being part of many EU agencies, being part of many EU programs, etc. And in fact, this is our approach or philosophy, if you like, in the absence of perspective, at least at this stage, to use every format and every dialogue we have to approximate further with the EU. And in this context, one, we see gradual integration into the EU single market as our next overarching benchmark. In fact, association agreement and DCFTAs already provide a solid ground to move towards this goal, and we are ready to exploit fully the opportunities the agreement offers us. And a perspective for gaining access to the EU for freedoms will serve as a great incentive and stimulus to continue with the implementation of the wide scale reforms. And two, enhance connectivity. It is key to politically and physically shrink the distance, to anchor us further with the EU. And it will certainly help us to better explore the possibility that DCFTA offers us. And here exploring the connectivity potential of the Black Sea is a very important milestone for us. And uh, we are having quite a number of initiatives to this end. Uh, well, despite the COVID, this year we still manage the European Union, the member states, and all of the partners will still manage to keep the Eastern Partnership active on our agendas. We held two high level BTC meetings, and more importantly, two decisions were made. One, to hold the physical summit next year under the Portuguese presidency, and two, to adopt a substantial declaration. And as we are gearing now towards the summit, the developments in the region require for adequate and for more attention. And the upcoming summit, upcoming Easter Partnership Summit, will be in a way decisive whether we are capable of properly assessing the partnership's decade experience and whether it will stay an efficient and interesting format for each and individual partner. In this context, I think it's crucial that the summit delivers a politically strong, forward-looking declaration. We expect that the summit reaffirms strategic importance of the partnership and its firm support for, towards the territorial integrity and sovereignty of the partners and acknowledges the European aspirations and European choice of the partners. But also differentiation and inclusiveness should continue to be the guiding principles of the Easter partnership. And the common denominator should not hamper us from wishing more, should not hamper us from coming closer to the EU. And to this end, we welcome very much the European Union Foreign Affairs Council conclusions that highlight and support strengthening of tailored 
bilateral relations. But also we share a goal of reinforced resilience of state institutions and society spelled out in the joint communication under five major policy areas. We really believe that these priorities offer a very good starting point that should take this partnership as a whole to the next level. And we look forward to start working on the joint uh, declaration, summit declaration, because it is important to start the process as soon as possible, especially amidst the covered development in the region. We all know this is not an easy exercise and we should not shy away from the challenges because they will not disappear. And to the end, let me just once again reiterate that we remain committed to implementation of the association agreement, which is the backbone of our relations with the EU, but we're also committed to continue to be an active partner within the Eastern Partnership. And we look forward to work on the post-2020 agenda with all our partners. And last, hopefully we will have the first draft joint declaration before the end of this year. So I'll stop here and I'm looking forward to our discussions today. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Salome. Lots of questions that we can come back to in the Q&A there, including about the Eastern Partnership Summit. Now, very, uh, our next speaker this, this morning is Vladimir Cook. And Vladimir is the acting head of European integration uh, within the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and European integration of the Republic of Moldova. So, Vladimir. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you, Salome, all, uh, Mr. Hackett, all, other, uh, all speakers. Uh, Lawrence, uh, really delighted to be at this panel. Uh, and this is, I mean, no, nobody can exaggerate the timeliness of this discussion, uh, given where we are, where the Eastern Partnership is heading to. So, uh, I will, there are many thoughts, many ideas, and I will try to group them in, in five uh, basic points I want to share with you today. So my first point is about basic perception. Uh, Mr. Hackett referred to it already, I will maybe elaborate. So we see the Eastern Partnership is, is a mature cooperation format with a well-established machinery of bilateral and multilateral platforms meeting regular <coughs> levels and with a quite di diverse agenda. This is very good, but comparing to where it started back in 2008 and 2009, I believe the impression of many stakeholders is that the Eastern Partnership has lost a bit of its political spark, political drive. So Eastern Partnership is basically the only EU policy framework for its Eastern neighbors. And I wish we heard a bit more political messages about Eastern Partnership in the State of the Union address, for example, in September. So my first basic message is that the Eastern Partnership should get back to the table of political leaders and not only on the eve of the summits. It should be a more constant uh, concern or uh, point of interest. My second point about is about successes. The Eastern Partnership has been the framework for some major achievements in, uh, for our three countries and not only for our three. In case of my country, I know mobility of people and trade are two major flagships. Um, in six years, over two thirds of Moldovan citizens uh, traveled visa-free at least once to EU. About two thirds of Moldovan exports and 50% of our imports are with EU. So these are major achievements, uh, but uh, these are the successes of not so distant past and present. So to remain a successful and uh, policy and cooperation framework, the Eastern Partnership should set such game-changing uh, targets for future. My third point is about challenges and commitments. Well, Eastern neighborhood is an area with a number of known challenges. Uh, three major challenges are stressing rule of law. And believe me, in Moldova, we are well aware of the need to improve the record on rule of law. Second is ensuring a sustainable economic growth. And uh, third is resolve major security issues such as protracted conflicts. Ireland, by the way, can offer a piece of very useful advice and expertise on all three of them, having experience. Uh, definitely COVID-19 has become a fourth systemic challenge and I believe we would agree with that and uh, many thanks for already provided support to all of our countries. So coming back to commitments, in this panel you see three countries which are very much committed through their association agreements to work on these systemic issues. And maybe we are at a bit different uh, level of progress in key areas, but what unites us is a clear and strong commitment to move ahead based on our firm, strong European aspirations and European choice. 
my first point is about shaping the future. Salome described very in a very detailed manner how uh, how she sees the the road to the summit. I can only subscribe to many to many of what she said. Um, I will I will just say that look, summit indeed is uh, is behind the corner. Um, and in terms of sectoral cooperation, in terms of substance, we largely support with the five areas proposed by European Commission, and we thank the institutions, thank Digineer, thank. European External Action Service and all the DGs and working on working preparing such a comprehensive uh, agenda. Building resilience is a good and timely objective, that's for sure. Uh, but our common goal should be a bit more ambitious in our view, and I would say the word should be the keyword should be integration. Call it what you like: gradual, step by step, sectoral, economic, but still integration. Um, just a few examples: in, in in past few months, Moldova and Ukraine have joined the EU Health Security Committee as observers. Uh, Moldova and Georgia are expected to become observers to the European Migration Network by the end of this year. We say Euro European bodies and networks. National Bank of Moldova just signed uh, an agreement with the European Central Bank on cooperating in the area of banking supervision and very important achievement for Moldova knowing the challenges we have in the banking sector. So the focus of our future work uh, should be on this type of gradual integration and deeper cooperation objectives. So I'm getting to my final point. Uh, in the weeks and months to come, besides our already ongoing important work, the focus should be to be put on designing truly ambitious future, ambitious future goals for the Eastern Partnership in medium to long term. At least some of these goals uh, could be should be the real game changers. In the financial sector, it would be perspective for joining joining the single euro payment area. In trade, as as Salome already referred to, it's gradual opening, working towards open uh, towards integrating um, the European single market in the form it's possible, of course. In digital sphere, we welcome the intention to extend benefits of the digital single market to the eastern neighbors uh, and partners. Uh, thinking of COVID recovery, perhaps we should think about a regional economic and recovery plan prioritizing investments such EU has proceeded with, with the Western Balkans. Uh, certainly security is a big area of cooperation and uh, just taking one example, cybersecurity, why not to open cooperation with ENISA, another important deliverable which we hope to get uh, in, uh, for, for our future, to have, to have it on our agenda. And clearly, our three countries, uh, Georgia, Moldova, Ukraine, will continue working together towards deepening dialogue with Europe and Commission. Uh, but what is very, very important is the encouraging messages from the member states. This is the political member that also uh, we need, the European institution needs to, to, pro to proceed further. So uh, this is what I wanted to say for the initial remarks. Thank you. I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you very much indeed, Vladimir. Um, and now to our final speaker this morning, at least in this part of the session. Um, this is Marina Mikhailenko. And Marina is the director of the Department for the European Union and NATO in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Ukraine. So Marina, over to you. Dear colleagues, uh, first of all, I would like to express my sincere gratitude to Andrew Gilmore and the Institute of International and the European Affairs, to Joan O'Brien, uh, uh, to Joe Hackett and uh, Lawrence uh, uh, Meredith uh, uh, and other our colleagues from the Department of Foreign Affairs of Ireland for making this important and timely event happen. Uh, despite the COVID and all restrictions related to it, uh, we continue our preparation for the EAP summit. Uh, the summit which uh, will be very important since our leaders should agree on a new agenda of the EAP for the next uh, decade. Uh, I'm confident uh, that uh, further success of the EAP uh, depends on a commitment to follow fundamental principles of this initiative and also a readiness to set new ambitious goals for ourselves. Uh, in Prague in, 19, in 2009, we agreed that uh, the main goal of the Eastern Partnership is to create uh, the necessary conditions to accelerate political association and uh, further economic integration between the European Union and uh, interested uh, uh, partner countries. 
Uh, we have also concluded uh, that EIP uh, base, based on uh, share uh, ownership and mutual commitments will be governed uh, by the differentiation and conditionality principles. Uh, and Riga and Brussels in 2015 and 2017, respectively, the EU uh, confirmed uh, uh, its full respect partner sovereign choice, ambitious uh, and goals in their relation with the EU. Uh, I am convinced that we cannot step back from these achievements within AAP. Now uh, it's time to acknowledge on practice that EAP needs to be flexible and differentiated uh, according to partners' aspirations and achievements. Uh, moreover, the latest uh, development in some of the partners' countries prove uh, vital necessity of such an uh, approach. Uh, the intention to build uh, the Eastern Partnership Policy um, on the minimum uh, common denominator for all is not the best solution if uh, we want to see this initiative as our common success and if uh, we uh, want to preserve the attractiveness of this initiative to uh, the associated partners. So, uh, uh, the AP uh, has to be politically strategic. Um, uh, the initiative's main bench benchmarks and incentives like the association agreements and visa liberalization are successfully achieved by those partners who uh, aspired them. Uh, to keep the AP attractive for, to the associated partners, to consolidate uh, its reforms, uh, reform motivation uh, role, and uh, further facilitate uh, political association and economic integration with the EU, it's high time to agree on the new AAP strategic objective. Uh, we consider that gradual integration into the EU internal market and perspective of the four freedoms uh, for the interested uh, and prepared partners uh, are ambitious and powerful uh, AAP goals uh, to be agreed uh, to, to the next decade. Uh, given a uh, different level uh, of the European aspirations among the partners, we suggest to exploit more effectively the AP differentiation principles. Uh, in this regard, uh, launching uh, the enhanced uh, dialogues in the EU plus three associated partners in the areas of DCFTA implementation and uh, sectoral integration uh, would significantly uh, contribute uh, to the proper development of the EAP. Uh, at the same time, with all respect to the uh, inclusivity principle, above mentioned strategic goals uh, should remain uh, open to all other partners uh, based on their uh, interest to proceed with stronger integration with the EU. Ukraine is interested to elaborate jointly with the EU and other partners the ambitious post-2020 EAP agenda, of course. Uh, this year, Ukraine and uh, other partner states, uh, um, Ukraine together with Moldova and Georgia, presented our vision on post-2020 agenda at a number of occasions. We have also stepped up with uh, concrete and very practical proposals within five priority policies suggested by the EU side. Some of our initiatives were included in the Commission's uh, joint uh, communication on Eastern Partnership beyond uh, uh, 2020. However, one important element was not properly taken on board, uh, neither in communication nor in uh, Foreign Affairs Council conclusions. I'm talking about security dimension of the EAP. Uh, the uh, COVID pandemic uh, has demonstrated that our health security is indivisible, and we are grateful uh, to the EU mobilizing the emergency package for EAP states to uh, uh, counter pandemic, as well as macrofinancial assistance uh, to cope with its social economic consequences. And I'm convinced that in the same way, we have uh, treat our security in general. That is why uh, shaping the AAP future, we have to develop its security dimension within the initiative. Without responding to uh, partners' security needs, we can hardly uh, pretend to implement successfully other goal, uh, goals of the AAP. 
So let me stress that Eastern partnership are not only uh, um, uh, Eastern partners uh, uh, are not only recipients of the uh, EU support in security domain. We are ready to contribute to strengthening security in the region and uh, combine our resources within PESCA program once respective legal basis uh, uh, is established. Uh, we consider that EAP resilience agenda suggested in the EU joint communication is a good framework to develop uh, security domain of the EAP and we welcome this approach. Uh, in the same time, we expect that the next uh, year Brussels EAP summit uh, will provide uh, so required political and strategic impetus for the EAP. Um, yeah, continually increasing turbulences in our region uh, proof uh, um, validity of this request. So we expect the EAP summit joint declaration will be prepared with due respect uh, to the joint ownership principle, as well as the partners' expectations and ambitions. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I stop here and I'm looking forward uh, to our discussion. Thank you very much indeed, Marina. I want to thank all of the five panelists, both for their substantive contributions and for being so economical with time. As an academic, this is very strange for me. Academics tend to go on and on and on and can never be managed where time is concerned. So thank you very much. I'd like to remind our audience that um, if anybody would like a question, you can do so by using the Q&A function on Zoom. A reminder also that we are on the record. We have some questions coming in, but I'd like if I could briefly just to indulge my position by asking each of our guests from Georgia, Moldova and Ukraine about your experience with COVID this year. Um, I think we had a sense that, at least back in the spring during the first wave of the virus, that in Eastern Europe, um, the impact of COVID was not as severe, at least in terms of infections and deaths. Certainly Poland, Czechia, down to Bulgaria, that was the case. But now we're in a very different situation. And in all three of those jurisdictions, the number of infections has reached record levels in recent days. So I wonder if you could give us a sense of how COVID has impacted. And to link this to the European Union, what do you think the European Union should be doing to help Georgia, Moldova, and Ukraine in the near future? Maybe we'll begin in uh, the same order um, with uh, Salome. Thank you very much. Uh, indeed, uh, the COVID is very much on everybody's agenda and also on our minds. From the very start, the government undertook uh, quite uh, resonant and quite strict measures to, to hamper, let's say, uh, the spread of the virus. And it did uh, deliver very significant results because for many months, for many months, we had very good results. We contained the virus. and. Actually, I could say that only since just uh, just three weeks ago, two, three weeks ago, the numbers started to increase. And before that, we had, let's say, I don't know, 10, 15 cases, maximum 30 cases. But unfortunately, in Georgia, uh, three weeks ago, the numbers started to increase, like in the rest of the world, like in European states, in all European states. And uh, we, this is the second wave, I believe. But in the beginning, we had we closed also the borders. We had the lockdown. And of course, that was, in a way, how we managed to contain the virus, but we cannot keep the closed country forever. I mean, the economies have to work and people need jobs. So definitely we opened border. Also, we, uh, we, did, we lifted the uh, lockdown. Uh, therefore, everything started to work. And, uh, and it was only natural that we would get high numbers. And as I'm not mistaken today, we had quite a high number, something like one seven. Five nine. This is a high number, but definitely, I'm I'm sure that uh, yeah. our health system will uh, will will deal with that accordingly. Until now, we're dealing, and I'm sure in the future we'll manage that as well. And we will contain also the virus, the spread of the virus in the future. Thank you very much. And Vladimir, thank you. Thank you. Yes, uh, 
COVID, big challenge. Uh, in our case situation has been, uh, let's say the number of cases has been growing gradually from dozens to hundreds. Now it's about 1000 plus minus every day. Um, we trying to manage uh, and of course there was uh, the, the initial lockdown uh, caused quite a serious uh, let's say uh, punched our economy uh, in general my understanding is that our gdp is going to decrease this year seven eight percent um, but well we are we are we are dealing with that um, also there was another factor the drought in in moldova it was uh, very little rain this year so in our agriculture I mean, the economy is very much uh, depending on the agriculture situation. So it's a double strike, let's say, uh, to, to, to Moldova. We'll have to, we'll have to deal with that. Uh, you ask about EU. I must say that uh, EU managed to mobilize very quickly the, 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 the support, the financial support, also to work through WHO, the health organization. And we've uh, been receiving um, some, some humanitarian uh, assistance and the medical equipment, the tests. Uh, now we're at the final stage of um, basically um, preparing to, to receive uh, hopefully the first financial aid. That's, that's very, very helpful. I mean, the, 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 the support was coming not only from the EU, from the member states, individual member states, so it's a it's a it's a positive cooperation. It's a real, um, let's say, friendly hand. Uh, of course, not only from you, the support was coming, but you, I would say, is one of the leading actor in that sense. So thanks for that, and I hope we'll get uh, go over uh, through this difficult situation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vladimir, and to you, Marina. Of course, uh, uh, COVID has affected severely Ukraine as other countries uh, in the world. Uh, and we are grateful to the European Union for the extremely important assistance provided to Ukraine in this context. Uh, we are talking about a direct response to the pandemic and support for Ukraine's macroeconomic stability. Uh, we discussed uh, this issue uh, regarding our cooperation uh, to counter COVID uh, um, during uh, the uh, recent uh, um, Ukraine-EU summit, which became, uh, despite uh, all the challenges with the countering COVID, uh, uh, we successfully conducted uh, this summit, which became for the EU the first uh, live summit with the partner states since the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, we discussed uh, the current situation with the spread of COVID and uh, joint efforts to over, uh, overcome uh, it. Uh, we also agreed that the cor uh, coronavirus uh, uh, vaccine uh, uh, should become uh, a common and accessible uh, global asset. And we hope uh, for further close cooperation with the EU uh, on this issue. Thank you very much uh, indeed. Um, now there are questions beginning to come in and um, I'd like to put the first one, if I could. Uh, it comes from Dimitro Shkurko from the National News Agency of Ukraine. He points out that all three trio countries are experiencing uh, complicated electoral campaigns. And this was also true of Central and East European countries in the 1990s. Um, in 1993, the European Union um, developed the Copenhagen criteria for membership for aspiring member states. And Dimitro's question, I think, um, asks whether this is a possible scenario for the trio countries to support their European aspirations. Um, so, should the European Union put in place more concrete um, criteria, if not with membership in mind, at least with the aim of increasing the scope and nature of integration significantly? And again, I'll throw that out to anybody who would like to answer. I'm happy to come in, John. Uh, okay, Lawrence. Yeah. Thanks very much indeed uh, for for the question. We we think it's extremely important um, the quality of elections, um, and um, of course, you know, with the local elections in Ukraine um, 
and imminent elections uh, in, in a few days, both in Georgia and Moldova. This is very topical. I think, what are we doing on the side of the European Union? I would say we have a very strong partnership, both with the OSCE um, office responsible for elections based in Warsaw, as well as with the Council of Europe, um, and, um, but also with civil society, who have an absolutely crucial role. So we think that every time there are um, uh, official international recommendations, it's incumbent on the governments to follow up on those recommendations. And on the side of the European Union, we are strongly supporting with financial support uh, all efforts to make sure uh, recommendations are implemented in between the elections. Of course, approaching the cycle, um, there, there's quite a lot of... Um, uh, it's, it's going to be immediately afterwards that we'll want to come in again and pick up the outcome of those elections because free and transparent elections are a, a people's right and the basis of all democracy. Thank you. Anybody else? Um, okay, I will move on to uh, our second question, which comes from Ambassador Balslev of Denmark, and it's about multilateral cooperation uh, within the Eastern Partnership. And uh, the question is whether um, the multilateral cooperation amongst the six has declined to such an extent that it should be replaced by cooperation between placed, I assume the question means on an institutional footing uh, between Georgia, Moldova and Ukraine, or should there be a renewed effort amongst the six uh, to um, kind of um, reconstitute that multilateral cooperation amongst the six? And again, perhaps Marina, or perhaps Salome, you would like to begin here. Yeah. Um, okay. oh. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. all right. Uh, firstly, like, I just missed a point uh, during my previous uh, answering the question, um, just uh, to outline, to mention that uh, we also received, like Ukraine, like Moldova and all the partners, we also received during the COVID assistance and very timely assistance from the EU and of course we are grateful for that assistance uh, as well. Uh, now coming to the East partnership as a multilateral format, I mean uh, we, the decade of the partnership has proven that it has been successful, it has been successful and in fact based on the uh, priorities and aspirations of each and every partner. I mean if I wanted to go further I did go further and I have now this solid uh, framework. The others behaved uh, according to their national interests. And together, the six of us were having also many projects where we cooperate together. But one important thing is the differentiation principle a tailored made, uh, tailored made bilateral relations, which should, which I believe should be the guiding principle of this partnership because uh, the developments also in the region, they show us that uh, more attention should be given to the differentiation principle and bilateral relations of the uh, within this partnership. But that does not mean in any way that we don't want the multilateral relations between the six of us. Projects continue. We are committed to work further with all the six with, within the partnership, with all the partners in the future as well. But for us, for Georgia, as I mentioned during my points, the guiding principle is still in the core of my relations with the EU is my bilateral relations. Yes, and Vladimir, yes. Thank you. Uh, Look, the, as I said also in my remarks, the multilateral meetings do continue. We just had a rule of law panel. We're having a string of uh, platforms meetings in November and preparing the summit. So this will continue and I'm, I'm sure it will continue as a successful uh, cooperation. Uh, and we are definitely not against uh, breaking up the Eastern Partnership uh, and, and uh, let's say uh, quitting with, with the multilateral six platform. Uh, I think all try to be all, all six try to be uh, active participants. Let's see now we see some new trends in, in this participation, but uh, I'll stay I'll stay on multilateral. In terms of cooperation between 
uh, what has happened new since 2017. In 2017, in the summit, we agreed that the three uh, associate partners will start an association-related dialogue with European Commission. And that materialized in, in meetings at the ministerial level between European Commission for Trade and three economic ministers on DCFTA. So this is a concrete thing uh, where in countries having a session agreement, a very, very high level of commitments and, 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 and let's say ambitions in, in reform, uh, there was a new format created on this specific uh, DCFTA free trade. It's a huge part of our session agreement. So I, I think that uh, format of uh, three plus commission should be continued, developed, maybe some new topics added like transportation energy. So that, that's an avenue to, to move, uh, move ahead. Thank you. Yes, and Marina. Yeah, of course, uh, as you know, uh, three guiding, uh, um, guiding principles of the EAP is uh, joint ownership, differentiation and inclusivity. And I can see the differentiation principles is helpful uh, to provide new impetus uh, uh, for the EAP. And I regard Ukraine, Georgia and Moldova uh, for stronger integration with the EU based on more for more principle. Uh, um, uh, sorry, I regard uh, Ukraine, uh, Georgia, and Moldova jointly suggest, uh, as um, Vladimir uh, uh, just uh, uh, mentioned, uh, enhanced format of dialogue uh, uh, EU plus three, uh, uh, where we can reach uh, more progress uh, for our mutual benefits. Uh, it's about uh, DCFTA, it's about sectoral integration, and, uh, and inclusivity for me means uh, that uh, each uh, of the Eastern partners should be given the uh, same perspective uh, for stronger integration with the EU uh, based on uh, more for more principles and progress in the European oriented reform. So uh, we stand for the launching of the enhanced uh, dialogue uh, among three uh, um, uh, associated partners, and uh, uh, we stand for multilateral cooperation in uh, uh, such spheres where um, our other um, partners interested in. Uh, thank you very much indeed. I have a very interesting question here from Peter Gunning, who is a former Irish ambassador and a member of the Institute. Peter asks a question about the May conclusions of the Council, where um, it was affirmed that there should be a greater effort made at strategic communication about the Eastern Partnership and about its benefits. And Peter's question is about disinformation in the context of sort of broad patterns of such, and also specifically in the context of electoral campaigns that are going on now. I wonder if I could begin with Lawrence, just about our ability and capacity to communicate effectively. I guess you could look at this meeting today as part of the Irish effort at communicating the importance of the partnership to us. So perhaps you'd say speak to this from the point of view of the Commission. Thanks again, John. And, and I mean, uh, uh, precisely, I would, uh, and I want to really thank you for hosting it because this is part of the strategic communication effort. I think it's really important uh, to bring Eastern partners and European Union citizens together. That's absolutely crucial. Um, I, I passionately believe in strategic communication. I'm very grateful to the small but dedicated team that uh, previous High Representative Mogherini set up. I think disinformation is a real challenge, but there's some very bright and talented specialists working uh, in, in a dedicated task force uh, every day, debunking myths uh, that are out there. Uh, that's uh, work that they do on a daily basis. Um, but I mean, on our side, what do we do European Commission? We're very focused on the positive communication because I think it's really important to, for, for all in the audience to, to hear um, we've just heard that the EU is the most trusted foreign institution across the Eastern Partnership. That's a really important achievement and shows that citizens realize that real tangible benefits are coming with support from the European Union, not just the institutions, but most importantly from the member states. It's the member states who pay the budget. So I think it's this 
cooperation of EU taxpayers that leads to really uh, making a difference on the ground for Eastern Partnership citizens. First, you have to have the results and then you have to communicate them. And if I may, just one uh, remark on branding. I think we've moved away from what used to be quite fashionable when I started my career of exotic names for programs, um, uh, the most famous of which is probably Erasmus, um, which is an excellent program. But um, I think we just go for straightforward communication, e EU for Georgia, EU for Moldova, and so forth, um, making sure that there are real, uh, the projects are delivering change and that all involved um, can be multipliers to get it out there. And of course, the government's own national agencies about which I'm sure other panelists will speak are key in this effort. So we also work with them to help strengthen their own strategic communication capacity, which is fundamental. Thank you. Yes. Um, again, amongst our guests uh, from Moldova, Georgia, Ukraine, if anybody would like particularly to come in on this topic of disinformation. Um, no, okay, if we, we can uh, move on. I have a question from uh, Gigi, uh, Gigi Adzi. Uh, and it's a question that's addressed to Lawrence uh, again this time. Um, now, this is a question that's way beyond my pay grade, I have to say. Um, you knew this one would feature, I suspect it is. When can the Associated, State, Associated States be advanced to the level of candidates for membership of the European Union? Well, um, thank you very much. I mean, I think uh, as the opinion polls uh, I was looking at this morning show, there is indeed very strong support for the European Union um, from the populations of uh, Georgia, Ukraine and Moldova. Also, by the way, uh, inter alia from the other three, uh, it's um, uh, especially high also in, in, in Armenia. So, I mean, that's an important basis. But I mean, we've always been very clear, you need to have a consensus in the Council of the Member States. And at, that, at this point, uh, that's not the case. So um, what's absolutely the most convincing argument that these three countries can make is reform, reform, reform. And uh, reform first and foremost in the interest of their own populations. And I know that that's a path that the, the governments are committed to. I'm sure that will be a really important part, by the way, of the election debates going on in each of these three countries. Uh, and I think um, what we've seen, and I'd be very interested in the Irish view perhaps from Joe in a moment, is the stronger the consensus among the population that uh, towards the European Union, the faster this reform effort can move. We saw that very much in, 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 in countries such as Poland, Estonia, and so forth. And, and therefore, I think it's uh, really important that there's a consensus on what kind of reforms are necessary. Justice reform is one I would particularly highlight. We just talked about the quality of elections, free and fair. So I think these are crucial issues um, that the governments are tackling and which will help found very solid foundations moving forward. Thank you. Again, um, perhaps Ambassador Hackett, I was very interested in what you said earlier about the transformative impact of the European Union on Ireland. But I guess we shouldn't forget that 15 years after we joined the European community, Ireland was literally an economic basket case. It's arguable that we had wasted a lot of the opportunities that had come along and all of that, of course, changed very significantly in the 1990s. Um, but I wonder if you would just speak to um, that theme um, about what value added the European Union um, constitutes to reform efforts and how that can be communicated effectively to our populations. Yeah, thanks. Let me just look, I won't skirt the first question because Lawrence kind of threw me the ball too. So I so let's put it bluntly, is Eastern Partnership and are the three countries here uh, on a pathway to EU membership? Um, let's just be clear. The answer to that right now is no, because the Eastern Partnership is not designed to be a pathway to EU membership. And it's really important that the union be clear and frank with its partners um, when it has these conversations. There's no point in people in Eastern partnership countries 
um, thinking that if they jump hurdle after hurdle after hurdle after hurdle, the door will open and they will become members. That's very different to saying that they will never become members because that's not the position and it's certainly not the Irish position and it's not the European Union position. Um, the, as Lawrence said, the council is going to be divided on that issue. If that issue was put now, um, there would be some member states well disposed, but the majority would not be. Um, and it would be a highly unhelpful and divisive discussion. Uh, but neither are the Eastern Partnership countries looking or asking for that uh, right now. I think by way of illustration, um, we saw the challenges around getting uh, progress on North Macedonia and Albania earlier this year. That's an indication of how fraught the enlargement agenda is for the European Union right now. And there is real and understandable concern amongst many members, including Ireland, that the union um, is quite fragile at the moment, uh, not just dealing with COVID, but dealing with Brexit and dealing with, you know, populism and expanding our membership uh, into regions that have their own profound challenges uh, would be not in the union's best interest right now. I mean, my view and the government's view is that if we work the association agreement and the DCFTAs, if we work on the things in the partnership that make a difference to people's real lives, the economy, transport, climate, if we further integrate through those areas, then over time, the issue of candidacy or membership will not seem as far-fetched as it once might have been. So nobody in Europe is going to say this is a pathway, but they're equally not going to be emphatically and say it'll never happen. So what we have to do on the partnership side and what the, what the countries who are in the partnership have to do is work through the hard grind of practical issues to, to reduce the number of differences and at the same time to address the very real issues around governance and corruption. Um, the second category of questions, yeah, I mean, I, I think that there is a reason Ireland is one of the most pro-European countries, because despite the makes, mistakes we made nationally, that the overwhelming number of Irish people believe that our, our relative economic prosperity, the level of social progress, and crucially, the way we lifted our eyelids from our relationship with the UK and took a more global perspective is overwhelmingly due to our membership of the European Union. Now, Maybe that's overstated, but I think that that's, that is a good feeling amongst the Irish population. Um, and I think what crucially we did that maybe our neighbours didn't do is our leaders and our people went to Brussels and did not present it as they prevented Brussels doing things to us, but that Europe and Brussels was something that opened doors to opportunity that we had to walk through. Mm -hmm. So from day one, you have to tell your people a positive narrative about Europe. If you go down the track of, of creating a defensive narrative, of highlighting the things you achieved as political leaders uh, in Brussels against the wishes of the European Union, then you create a negative narrative, which is very hard to escape from. Yeah, it's self-reinforcing, isn't it? Um, a question from um, Michael O'Hurley is about, about the environment and about the deliverables within the Eastern Partnership. He asks, what progress has been made on environmental supports for the Eastern Partnership and what have the Eastern Partnership countries done to enhance their contribution to this goal? I think Lawrence mentioned the um, climatological and environmental dimensions at the beginning. Um, I might start here uh, perhaps with Vladimir, uh, if I may, uh, on the environmental dimension and the deliverables. Thank you. Well, indeed, the environment is probably one of uh, the, the, the area where the, the change uh, is not that easy to get because it's a, usually it means a lot of changing regulations, the practice, the habits of, of the people. But in the last couple of years, we were working uh, very actively on that. We have been changing uh, all our legislation on energy, for example, on, on uh, energy efficiency, uh, the, the, also on waste management. So we have been putting in place a, a robust legal, a legal framework to, to start changing the further the implementation. Um, 
I think a big game changer for us will be the European Green Deal. This is one of the announced five areas for cooperation with the Eastern partners. We're really, really looking forward to, 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 to work together with you on green transition and uh, making uh, our economies more climate neutral. That, that's very important. This week, I think our, but also I, I guess uh, other Georgia Crane have, have been also joining the European Green Week. Uh, we're trying uh, to, uh, in, at the ministry, to implement some initiatives on, on uh, for example, waste management, separating and recycling, recycling. So we're fully committed um, in our negotiation with the EU now, the new asso asso association agenda, our, uh, let's say the a political uh, a document which is setting the priorities in uh, what for next year. So environment is there. So we will be working um, very actively with you on, on that. Uh, and having uh, on the basis of our commitments, uh, our international commitments on sustainable development and, uh, and fighting the climate change as well. So that, that remains one of the, it will be one of the biggest uh, priority uh, for future years, for sure. Thank you. And uh, Salome. Yes, thank you. Indeed, the green is very high on the agenda now with the EU, within the EU member states, but this is also very high on our agenda as well. It's not easy because it is also linked with lots of reforms and quite costly reforms, but at the same time, we are committed to catch up and be the active part of that just very recently. And also Vlad mentioned that this is also a part not only within the Eastern Partnership, but also within our association within our agreements, association agreements. And just very recently, we have adopted energy efficiency package. Of course, this is not uh, that much. Uh, this is not the end of the road. I mean, there is still a lot to do, but we are definitely inclined to work with the EU, with the EU member states, with the partners to contribute to the green uh, energy. Thank you. And Marina? Yeah, uh, we discussed uh, this issue, how to deepen our cooperation during uh, the uh, recent uh, EU-Ukraine summit. So uh, Ukraine has an ambition uh, to approximate its uh, policies uh, and legislation with the European Green Deal. Uh, so uh, uh, we continue to work uh, um, together with the EU to implement all our ideas in this uh, particular uh, uh, sphere. And if you, if I may, uh, I would like to come back to the disinformation because it's very important direction on our further cooperation within the EAP. Uh, we um, uh, counter uh, cyber threats and disinformation. Uh, might become uh, the new area of cooperation between EAP and uh, um, states and the EU. And we propose uh, to invite uh, the partner states to the workshops and conferences uh, held by the European Center uh, of Excellence uh, and Countering Cyber Threats and widening uh, the network of uh, Europol license offers in the partner states. Um, thank you very much indeed, Marina. Um, another question from Dara Moriarty, who is a researcher with the Institute. It's a question to each of the representatives from Georgia, Moldova and Ukraine, but um, Lawrence and Joe, you were quite welcome to have a go at this as well. It's a very timely question. Are you hopeful that a change of administration in the United States with a harder line potentially on Russia, Dara suggests, will give renewed impetus to US engagement in the region. So does the prospect of a Biden administration come the 21st of January, um, is it an attractive one? Do you see it as something that will um, help you in and of itself, but also help in this, um, um, kind of cooperation uh, around European integration. And I'm not sure, uh, Marina, perhaps you might like to begin again there. The prospect of a Biden administration, what do you think that means for Ukraine? 
Um, we have a bipartisan support uh, um, uh, in uh, fighting against Russian aggression. So uh, uh, we, sh I'm sure that uh, we will have a, a very good relationship and uh, a cooperation both with the uh, Biden future possible administration and with the uh, Trump administration as well. Yes. And Vladimir? Thanks. Uh, speaking of Moldova, I think the US engagement uh, wasn't really depending on the administration in, uh, in big strategic terms, let's say, uh, in, in Washington. It was constant. And I think US, in terms of reforms, priority for reforms, I think US and EU goals are more or less the same. So it's, it's no competition, it's cooperation between you and US on, on main goals to, to achieve and uh, changing the democratization, the rule of law and other things. So I would imagine that uh, the major change in terms of, of view on Moldova, there will be no major change. It, it will be the same, um, the same, let's say, goals to, to achieve, to improve situation here. Thank you. And Salome, uh, from the Georgian perspective, Yes, thank you. I mean, what I could say is that the US has been uh, the strategic partner for Georgia for years now, whether with the Republicans or the Democrats. So we're having in our country democratic development as a bipartisan support from US. So whoever is coming and who is go, who, whose administration is going to be there in the White House after these elections, I don't think that will have any impact, especially on our European integration part. Definitely US is supporting us in terms of democratic development, economic development, but that has no direct contact or link with the European integration path. And we definitely hope that in the future, whoever wins uh, these elections, the support that our strategic partner is giving us will continue in the years to come. Thank you. I'm not sure if you want to add something, Lawrence and Joe. Will a Biden administration, the prospect of it, does it make a material difference to EU-US relations come 2021? I mean, what I can say um, is that uh, over an experience of um, 20 years in, in, in working in, in the broader Europe, if I can put it that way, uh, when we have a strong EU-US transatlantic relationship, that's good for the EU and it's good for our partners. So I hope that what comes out, whatever color, that the, there will be a strong commitment um, on the side of the US administration to working um, for um, a brighter future also with Georgia, Ukraine and Moldova. And I'm confident that that will be the case as our panelists have said. Thank you. Yeah. And Joe? Um, well, you've stressed several times uh, that this is an on the record briefing. <laughs> so yes. um, I, I, I think that's reflected in the nature of the answers you've received. And uh, I would just fully align with what Lawrence has just said there. Okay. Thanks very much. Um, a very interesting question now on security cooperation, and it comes from the ambassador of Bulgaria, uh, Ambassador Karadjova, and she asks uh, about the perspective again of our three Eastern Partnership partners. Um, what do you think is the value added in security cooperation um, via the European Union in the CSDP? framework uh, or separately uh, in and around NATO. So perhaps you would just speak to um, existing mo modes of security cooperation and how they are best delivered through uh, the CSDP and or through NATO. Um, perhaps Vladimir, you would like to begin here. Sure. Uh, in my case, the answer will be shorter because we are a neutral country. We don't have ambition to join NATO. That's uh, so we we try to indeed develop uh, the security cooperation with EU. Um, the CSDP is uh, the main area uh, for the moment. We, we've been uh, deploying a few of our experts, military experts, in in some of the CSDP missions. Not too many. This is this costs to to, to the budget, but. Even now, I think we have a doctor, a medical officer in Mali, in CSDP mission in Ali, and another one have been just reduced because the mission has been reduced. 
and we will be working, of course, to rotating and uh, maybe increasing this presence in CSDP missions. Uh, so that's one. What we want to, uh, uh, let's say, increase, yes, indeed, the dialogue on, on hybrid threats, on, as I mentioned in my presentation on cybersecurity, let's say these emerging threats uh, type of cooperation uh, would, be, would be one of the future goals. So I, I, I would, yeah, I would also high level security dialogue, Georgia has one. We are also aspiring to, to have one. So to have an, a platform for exchanging with you on various security issues. I would put it like that. Thank you. Yeah. And Marina? Yeah. Uh, as I said before, we cannot build this successful Eastern partnership without responding to partner security needs. Uh, the ongoing conflict, uh, uh, hybrid and cyber threats, uh, which we all face, uh, requires new security platform uh, to be established within the AAP. And um, besides the participation of the interesting AAP countries uh, in the PESCO programs, uh, we also propose uh, uh, such uh, an initiative in order to intensify our common uh, efforts as setting up uh, an AAP EU eStratcom panel for discussing issues related to tech and disinformation and uh, elaborating proper solution, as I just mentioned, then uh, uh, envisaging uh, participation of the Eastern partners in the event of the European Centers of Excellence for counting hybrid threats. Uh, allowing uh, engagement of the interested partners uh, in the work of the EU uh, Agency for Network and uh, Information Security and the EU uh, Rapid Alert si uh, System. So we are very much interested to deeper our cooperation in this particular uh, sphere. And finally, uh, for the Georgian perspective again, uh, Salome. Thank you very much indeed. Um, since uh, 2017, we're having actually a high level strategic dialogue with the EU. And this is the format where, discuss, where we discuss issues of uh, high importance for us. And for us, that is definitely the conflict with Russia. At the same time, we're also discussing such issues as cybersecurity, hybrid threats, and many, many others. And not to forget that European Union is a co-chair at the Geneva discussions. And not to forget that the European Union was a mediator to, con to conclude, to bring to conclusion the ceasefire agreement with Russia during uh, uh, the war in 2000, back in 2008. Uh, when it comes to our participation in the CSDP missions, definitely we're participating in Mali, we're participating in the Central African Republic, with NATO as well, we're having very close relations, you know we're a candidate country, we're having ANP, NGC meetings on a regular basis, and uh, Georgia has shown, I think, and has proven throughout the years that we are not the country who is only getting the benefits, we're also the country who is contributing greatly, and also with the ultimate goal of uh, our, uh, our soldiers who are uh, participating in the missions, we've been th throughout the years participating in the ISAF mission in Afghanistan and we're still staying in the in the mission in Afghanistan under the NATO surveillance. Thank you. Uh, thanks. Um, we are coming towards the end now but there are two more questions. One of them from Andrew Gilmore of the Institute and Andrew's question is about energy and principally to Lawrence and to Salome. Um, it's, he, he says the European Commission has provided significant support to the Black Sea Connectivity Initiative. And he would like if you could perhaps provide us with some practical examples of how this initiative has fared uh, to date. And actually, it's a question I often ponder. I spend a lot of time on the Black Sea myself, on the Bulgarian, beautiful Bulgarian coast. And I sort of, as I gaze out to sea, I wonder about what kind of patterns of cooperation around wind power, for example, have been developed. So perhaps, Lawrence, you could go first. Sure, thank you very much. And thanks to Andrew for this very interesting and timely question, actually, because we've just had the visit of the Prime Minister of Georgia to Brussels. I'm sure Salome will say a, a talk about that. And this is uh, very high on the agenda between relations between the European Union and, and Georgia. 
<clears throat> and I mean, clearly the Black Sea is, is crucial. Um, and uh, I mean, that is crucial in a number of ways. I think it's uh, simply transport to start with. I think one of the areas we're looking at is how can we further strengthen ferry links, precisely as you say, John, with um, uh, Bulgaria or Romania uh, and, and strengthen those links. And of course, um, you talk of energy, a major uh, projects are the Southern Gas Corridor, TAP, and ensuring the flow of, of uh, gas in particular across the Caucasus, uh, across the Black Sea and reaching both through the Western Balkans and eventually the European Union. So, I mean, this is a major infrastructure project that we're engaged on with the um, European Union, but also with the European Investment Bank, the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development. Uh, and, and a key issue here on which I'd be very interested to hear Salome's comments is, how can uh, uh, Georgia strengthen its capacity in a deep seaport? And there's a very lively debate uh, going on about that. We stand ready um, to support that capacity because we, like they, uh, believe in strengthening uh, connectivity across the Black Sea. Also digitally, by the way, there's a cable under the Black Sea and this is, uh, as we're in a digital event, gets all the more important. So thank you, John. Thank you, and Salome. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Lawrence. Indeed, uh, our Prime Minister uh, was in just recently in Brussels and his main point was uh, two points, many points actually, but let me outline indeed the connectivity point, because this is one of the, let's say, milestone for us, you know, in difference to uh, Ukraine or Moldova has no land border with the European Union and the only border that we have is the through the Black Sea. But what is a Black Sea? Relatively small Black Sea in the 21st century. It's nothing. And you know that the EU has already extended the TNT on the territory of Georgia and the concrete projects have been already identified to finance, but definitely there is a lot of space to fill in when it comes to strengthening connectivity across the Black Sea. And we actually presented with two initiatives to the EU. One is development of the feeder ferry connections across the Black Sea. So on the one side, we're having Georgia. On the other side, we're having Bulgaria, Romania, and Ukraine. And uh, another project that we proposed is constructing a Black Sea underwater electricity transmission line between Georgia and Romania as a contribution to the energy security. And it will be definitely a very strong uh, incentive to development of renewable energy sector. And definitely we hope for the EU's active engagement in this process. But when it comes to certain ports here, Georgia, I think uh, when, if we're talking about the Anaclia port, I mean, I'm not the expert of course uh, on that issue, but uh, as I know, the government has already uh, declared that um, has not, is, is, is uh, intending to declare the tender on, uh, on construction or of its construction. Thank you very much indeed. Now we've got about a three minutes or so left and in concluding I'd like perhaps to go back to each speaker and the question is um, what do you hope will come out of the next Eastern Partnership Summit and looking ahead to the more medium to longer term how would you like to see the Eastern Partnership evolve? Um, perhaps I'll begin with Lawrence. Thanks very much, John, and a uh, um, pleasure to be here with such a distinguished panel. And um, I think what we hope for from the Eastern Partnership Summit, and this despite the tensions that we must recognize of the resumed hostilities between our Armenia and Azerbaijan and also the backdrop of events in Belarus, we very much hope the summit will provide a common vision between Eastern partners and the European Union uh, on the priorities for future cooperation. We've set out R5, I won't list them again. Um, and I think that's based on what citizens want. So we hope that that will develop. And I think success will be benchmarked and we're keen to set measurable targets um, uh, to measure progress. By, by what difference it makes to the lives of people in the Eastern Partnership. And uh, explaining that both to them and to EU taxpayers is crucial to the success of this project. Thank you. And Joe? 
Yeah, very similar. I mean, at the end of the day, this is about, this is not about bringing Eastern Partnership countries closer to Europe. This is about improving the quality of life for the citizens of Eastern Partnership countries and giving them the opportunity, if they so wish to choose, to increase their cooperation uh, with Europe. So we would want on the values and rule of law issue to see that advance to the point where citizens can freely make their choices in those countries where they currently are not free to make those choices. Obviously, that doesn't apply to these three. And we would like to see increased cooperation and integration where appropriate on that range of practical areas that does make a practical difference to people's lives and where over time they will facilitate a greater political as well as economic integration with Europe. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Vladimir, if you would like to go next. Uh, I'll risk, but I'll try to be a bit lyrical maybe. Look, this ship has been on the seas for quite some time. What we need now to clean up the bottom, to have a friendly team, to have a, and to have a new map uh, and to, to get to the, to the lands. So I hope after the summit, we will have this wind in our, so helping us in our direction and the, 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 the sea water will be calm to allow the ship to move towards its, its goal. Sorry for being so <laughs> lyrical, but that's, that's the general feeling I am. But of course, I will su subscribe to whatever Salome, Marina and others will say. Well, this is one of the reasons we like Moldovan people so much. We share this sort of attachment to lyricism. Uh, if you've seen our president, you will understand exactly what I mean. Um, Marina, would you like to go next? Yeah. Um, we expect uh, that next uh, year Brussels AP summit uh, will provide so, uh, so required political and strategic impetus for the EAP. And uh, this summit is very important because it should test strategic uh, viability of this initiative. And to pass the summit successfully, uh, um, as, as I said before, we should remain committed to the founding principles, differentiation, uh, during ownership and inclusivity, as well as initiative main purpose to contribute to the partners' uh, political association and uh, economic integration within uh, uh, the uh, EU. And uh, to sum up, if you allow me to sum up our discussion, I would like to address to my Irish, to our Irish friends. Uh, after the Brexit, uh, you are in turn to uh, get a flag from the UK on the leading role on the EAP and even more so on the eastern uh, flank to the EU. And I hope we can count on you. And if so, uh, you can count on us. Thank you very much indeed. And finally to you, Salome. Um, thank you very much. I think I talked to in details what we expect from the Eastern Partnership Summit sometime next year, but let me reiterate that our expectation is that the Eastern Partnership, the region as a whole, will stay strategically important for the European Union. And we know that the Eastern Partnership is not about the membership. We acknowledge that uh, quite well. But at the same time, Eastern Partnership could definitely bring the process and could bring the relations of all the partners or um, of all the partners to the new level uh, with the relations with the EU. And definitely, uh, as in five uh, major policy area uh, priorities. I mean, it should, the Eastern Partnership should, should bring some practical uh, uh, and tangible results for the citizens. But at the same time, not forget, but it's not possible without a strong political support from the European Union, from Brussels and member states, definitely. Thank you. Yeah. Um, thanks so much indeed, Salome. Um, you echoed my very thought, which was going to be my concluding thought, was that this year, more than any year in recent memory, has reminded us that the problems we face are not problems we face separately, but they are mostly collective action problems. And the way you solve these problems is through functional cooperation across borders, or at least there is much more to be gained by doing that rather as opposed to a policy of um, opposition to such. Uh, so I want to thank our speakers 
very much indeed to Lawrence Meredith, to uh, Joe Hackett in Dublin, uh, to uh, Vladimir in um, uh, Kishinev, I think, uh, to Marina in Kiev and Salome in Tbilisi. Thank you so much for your contributions. It was a really rich discussion and all the more welcome because we don't get enough opportunities to engage with and discuss the issues that predominate in uh, Eastern Partnership countries and beyond. So thank you very, very much indeed on behalf of the Institute. Thank you.